Hello and welcome to the Cardiac Cats YouTube channel. I'm your host, Jacob Shorba, and today we're going to be going through some potential offensive fits in the 2024 NFL free agency period. So I've got eight players for you guys. Could probably throw more in here, but trying to focus on the ones I think would be the most realistic, perhaps, um, or more so just players I think that fit the scheme better. And so we've got some guys to talk about. Got a lot of receivers, um, but definitely a huge focus on the offensive line. Seeing the way they finished last year and just weren't really a good unit overall. And obviously we're going to talk about that given the thumbnail. Um, you got a fun player to talk about at the end of it. But we're going to go ahead. We're going to kick this off with receiver. And the first guy we're going to talk about is someone they've been linked to in the pre-free agency process. And that is Gabe Davis, former UCF player. Um, played as well up in uh, Buffalo for four years. This guy, man, when he's good, he, he's a hell of a football player. He's one of the best in the league. When he's bad, he's one of the worst in the league. And that makes you essentially kind of average, I guess, would be how I'd put it. He's not one of my favorites, right? But I'm still going to throw him on here because what you can't deny is that the skill set that Gabe Davis has – is exactly what the Jaguars are missing. They need a receiver that can catch the deep passes, that can have the explosive plays, and Gabe Davis might fit that. And really, it comes down to the price for me. I think it's it's way too expensive at $12 million. I know I'm kind of just roasting him, you know, after throwing him on this video, but he's got to be on this video because this is a the guy they've been linked to and someone who does make some sense, just not really a player I necessarily love. To give you guys an idea of what we're talking about when we're saying that Gabe Davis is both a high-level producer and also someone who could be one of the worst receivers in the league seemingly at times, here's the stat lines from week six on. I think this is very interesting. We're just going to go over yards. 21, 6, 87, 0, 56, 0, 105, 0, 0, 130, 21, zero i mean it when i say it when gabe davis is good he's really good when he's bad you aren't gonna get a single thing out of him and so i don't know where that fits i don't know what a team does i hope it's a little cheaper in this but this is the contract projection for him and this might be a player that we go see him pursue and you can't deny that at the very least in the games he's good he is going to be a huge part of the offense if he comes down to Jacksonville. It's just the question of, are you okay having games where he's just not getting receptions? Do you have enough there in your other players to justify it? So that's really the big question with him. Probably my least favorite on this list, but someone I am going to still throw out there for the Jaguars. Now our next guy. Someone I'm a lot more fond of. Kendrick Bourne. Receiver for the New England Patriots. Now Bourne has not been some incredible producer throughout his career but he has consistently improved as a receiver and he's been the most reliable player for the patriots in spite of honestly just being a part of a really bad offense an offense that just does not have a whole lot going for it hasn't had great quarterback play and you know i'm not going to blame that all necessarily on mac jones there's problems with with a lot of things in new england but this year kendrick bourne was on track to probably end up getting just shy of a thousand yards. He played he played eight games, ended up getting one of his first big injuries in a while. Um, ended up having 406 yards though, consistently producing for his team. His worst games were 26 and 29. The rest of them, he's up in the 30s, all the way up to 90 yards. If you're looking for a guy to fill a role in your offense, to be a good starter, not necessarily a game breaker, right? But a good starter, someone who's shifty, someone who can get open, and someone who can look really good after the catch to contribute in every way you're asking for. Kendrick Bourne's that guy. And you can get him for a really good deal. You can go out and sign him for probably six, seven million a year. And I'd probably lock him up for two seasons. That would be my take. This is one of the guys I really like for the Jaguars. The other interesting tidbit I've mentioned before when we talk about Kendrick Bourne is that Kendrick Bourne was the alternative to Calvin Ridley. 
two years ago when they traded for him. The idea was that if they couldn't land the Calvin Ridley trade, they were going to get the other possible player that was available immediately to help the offense. Cause we knew at that time, like they weren't doing as well. They got, they really caught fire after the trade deadline, but the Jaguars clearly needed another receiver. And that was their best option and a player they nearly traded for. Well, now he's on the market. We know Trent Baalke tends to not really change his opinions that often either. And I don't think there's any reason to think Kendrick Bourne is a worse player than he was before. I think he's a better player. I think he's gotten better every single season. I think he'd just be a really good fit in this receiving core. And he's clearly a guy that they've been interested in before. The other thing to note about him, he's been really good with drops throughout his career. Since heading to the New England Patriots, he's had five drops over all of his catches. He had zero this last year as well. So I think this is a guy that can excel in some of the things Jacksonville is missing. I think he could also be someone who can make some really good catches down the field. So it's a very logical signing when you look at the cost. You look at the fact that this could be a Zay Jones replacement, although I think Zay Jones is going to stay put right now. And it could also be considered kind of your consolation prize, not that I'd consider it a prize, uh, compared to Calvin Ridley. If you lose Calvin Ridley in free agency, this would be a smart move to basically satisfy your immediate need at receiver to the point where, hey, if someone falls in the draft, that's great. Let's go get them. But if it doesn't happen, get the best player. You don't have to force it. And you've got a solid group of receivers that you can rely on. I think Kendrick Bourne is that kind of player that you can rely on. So that's my thoughts on him. Definitely one of my favorite guys for this process. Another one that's really interesting comes from the division. That's Noah Brown from the Houston Texans. The thing with Brown is that, well, he's not this crazy big producer, this big time receiver. He has been able to put up some huge plays down the field. Last year, you saw a lot of him getting, you know, these 50, 60 yard bombs from CJ Stroud on scramble drills. This is a player that you add for cheap that can come in and potentially add a little bit of that vertical element to the offense. I think if you need him to, he can start. This is an even more affordable version, I affordable backup, not a version necessarily of uh, Kendrick Bourne, different player, right? But someone who can be a backup, someone who can start if you need to, just, just a placeholder, right, for a little bit, and has a little bit of that ability to take the top off the defense and make the big play, which, like we've said multiple times already, Jaguars are missing that. So very much like what he could be, He's also got versatility playing inside and outside. He had some games where he's lined up as a slot receiver. So he's he's able to do it all, you know. So very much like uh, Noah Brown as an option and definitely an affordable one for the Jaguars. Now we're going to talk about offensive line from this point on. We're going to start with an early favorite of mine, someone that would probably fit the bill pretty well as far as what the Jaguars could be looking for at center, trying to get a veteran presence in that could pretty much push Luke Fortner. And honestly, if anyone's pushing Luke Fortner, they're going to win the battle. Let's be real. Connor Williams from the Miami Dolphins. Connor Williams, based off all the projections I've seen on his cost, this feels like one of the big steals of free agency. And I understand that he has an injury right now, I believe he tore his ACL, so that's a huge problem. But to me, if he's got to come in a couple weeks into the season and we're okay taking time, laying him adjust, I think that's a really good situation to be in. Because here's the way I look at it. He has consistently, over the course of his career, gotten better every year. That's a very clear thing that you can see. When you just go and look as PFF grades, you look at his pass block efficiency, Every year it gets closer and closer to 100. Every single year it does. He has six years of experience, yet he is currently not even 27 years old. So this is a young and incredibly experienced player. Played a lot of snaps, been very healthy throughout his career, aside from the injury last year. The way I see it, you can bring him in cheap for a year. Because it's probably how long he's going to have a deal for. Because he's hurt. 
So you bring him in for one season, you start him a little ways down the road. Maybe he's not perfect that year, right? But by the end of the season, I think you see a very good version of him and you could potentially consider making him a long-term fixture on the offensive line. And you talk about the kind of player he is too. I think he's someone who translates very well, comes from a zone blocking scheme in Miami, someone who could do really well moving around on Jacksonville's very athletically built offensive line. So Connor Williams, he's one of my favorites. I just don't know 100% for sure what he's going to sign because I feel like he deserves way more than this personally. But this is everything I see. So very much curious what happens there. But he's a really good player. I do actually think he's the best center of all these players available. It's just the injury concern. Now Lloyd Cushenberry, he'll be one of our other centers we talk about here. And the more expensive one. It's a younger player, um, not necessarily a, a huge mauler or anything like that, but someone who kind of fits like the idealistic version of what the Jaguars probably think Luke Fortner could be, which is this very athletic player that somehow just doesn't have strength issues. Sorry, strength issues show up at all on the field. Well, Cushenberry does so well is he gets in the right places. He's very smart, very high IQ player, knows how to block well, and he's gotten consistently better throughout his career. A very interesting thing from, I believe, one year ago, he was a potential trade candidate for the Jaguars. Not that that actually happened or was like close to it. Obviously, he didn't get traded, but there was a little bit of talk about it. And so I think he's a fit. I think he's a player who makes a lot of sense. My issue is that I don't know if the Jaguars are willing to admit, no matter how clear it is, that Luke Fortner isn't the guy. And if you sign a center for four seasons like this, which you're going to have to do, it's going to be a long deal for him because he very much earned the extension of that period. I, I don't know if Jacksonville does that because I think what they want to do is they want to believe that they can bring in a guy to challenge and that Luke Fortner is just going to rise to the occasion and still be the guy. So I'm not sold that they go this route. I think it's a lot of money on the offensive line too. You consider they just re-signed Ezra Cleveland. They're keeping Brandon Scherf and Cam Robinson for now. I think they probably try to restructure those, uh, probably try to negotiate a new contract, make it cheaper, keep it one year. But I really, I, I don't see them paying four guys on the offensive line a ton of money. I don't think that happens. But nevertheless, like, if we're talking about players that make sense as a fit, it is going to be Lloyd Cushenberry, even if I don't think it happens. So those are my thoughts on him. I probably won't get your hopes up too much that he's on the Jaguars. And hey, if we're surprised, we're surprised. I'm good with that. He's a good football player. Now the last center here, and one that probably makes the most sense of these, Mitch Morse from Buffalo. This is an older player but one that's been a very good pass blocker throughout his career. And you think about what Jacksonville wants and the way they built their offensive line. Hey, I complain about it, but what they do is they sign these guys that are good pass blockers and just kind of average or bad at the run game. They honestly just don't really value the run game at the end of the day. They don't value run blocking nearly as much as what you would hope. And not that Mitch Morris is terrible at it, but you can look at his grades throughout his career, the things you hear about him, he's very much an average run blocker at best, right? But he's a very good pass blocker. That's what the Jaguars want. That's what they're okay with. If you want a veteran to come in to push Luke Fortner and live in this world where you think he's going to just go and earn it after this season or be the guy long term after that, Mitch Morse would probably be the one that makes the most sense because I don't think he's a long term solution. I could see the Jaguars going down that kind of route. And yeah, obviously I'm being uh, a little funny with how I'm talking about the whole Luke Fortner thing, but I, that's how they see it right now pretty clearly. I don't think they're going to make a long-term change there. I think they're just going to try to push things. So Mitch Morse probably makes the most sense of these players. Now two more guys, one being a guard that I think can really move around anywhere on the interior and one that 
has been a guard for about half his career, but pretty clearly should be a tackle. We're going to start with the interior guy, Damian Lewis from Seattle. Now, yeah, I get it. Damian Lewis is the left guard. We just signed Ezra Cleveland. Lewis can play right guard. He can play center. You can move him around if you need to. Not that he has a ton of experience at center, but he has played a little bit there. I think you could kick him over to the right side if you need to. I'd feel fine bringing him in to play an air position. I'm not that worried about it. But this is a player the Jaguars have been linked to as potential fit for him. Not that we've heard news that they are pursuing him, but just one they've been linked to. I think Damian Lewis is a guy who has a lot of upside when he comes in. I think that he's a player who would bring more strength to this offensive line, bring more physicality. If the Jaguars are going to address things on the offensive line with other players, we would imagine that physicality is going to be one of the focal points. Because otherwise, why say it? Why bring it up at the press conference? No one asked you. You said it yourself. So I think that's actually a thing that they would care about in bringing in more players. And the guys that they keep, they just think are going to develop it or, you know, something was wrong. I don't know. But that would be my best guess. Damian Lewis is one of those players that fits that. I think he moves pretty well for his size as well. So he should be able to fit the scheme well, be a good addition that can fill the need of physicality on this offensive line and have the upside to just become a better player throughout this contract. This is someone to me that is still ascending that shows high IQ moments. He's just got to put it all together, limit the pressures. Just, yeah, that that's it. That's what I'd say about Damian Lewis for sure. And he's a guy that I'd love to bring in in free agency. But on this list, as far as the best player I think the Jaguars could bring in, especially if they can get it to a dollar amount that doesn't count this as a third round CFA to where you could potentially lose what you would get for Calvin Ridley departing, assuming that happens. And it's probably the most likely outcome. I think Mike Onwenu from the New England Patriots is a fantastic fit for the Jaguars. Right now, the price range actually falls a little short of $60 million. That's what I've seen everywhere, but I do think it gets driven up a little bit. That's around the mark where you get to the top end of the fourth round, guys, and that would not cancel out your comp pick. So that's a really important thing to me. I, I don't want to just lose him for nothing, right? We're talking about a major pick. We, we're essentially talking about like 96 in this year's draft. And you can get good players at that point. Now, if you can get a special player... Screw the comp pick, right? Like, if it's worth it to go out for that kind of guy, it's worth it. But I think Mike Onwenu is a good balance where you can get a really good player who doesn't subtract from that. It's a really good use of your money. You save when you consider that you would probably release Cam Robinson after this move. It's a player the Jaguars have also been linked to. And your guy, Anton Harrison, can play at left tackle. And the thing with Onwenu, Talking about the garden tackle debate, you can see pretty clearly when you look at his grades for this last year and just how he has generally played a tackle, he becomes a much better player when he's outside. I'll give you an example. This year, he started from week two to week 18. Weeks two through five, he played guard. During those games, he had a 56.7, a 49.8, a 40, and a 59.8. Every single grade is below average. He moves out to right tackle. These are his grades to start. 74.5, 60.9, 84.4, 83.5, 80.7. This is a good football player when he's at tackle. And the New England Patriots shifted him around a ton, and it might work to your advantage as far as contracts, because you might say, well, we don't completely know what you are, because... You have not stayed in one position your whole career. So there's a little bit of risk here. We can't pay you top end dollar amount, even though I really believe deep down that he's going to be a damn good right tackle on their team. That's how I would treat it. I think he would be a heck of a heck of an addition for the Jaguars. Someone I would definitely be interested in pursuing. Um, and they've been linked to him. Like I said, this would probably be the big addition I could see taking place on the offensive side of the ball. And I love it because you get cheaper, you get better, you get someone who's been healthy throughout his career as well. 
and you feel really good about it because now everyone is playing in their best spots. You got Anton, you got Ezra, you got Mike on when you on the right side, figure out the interior however you want. I would really like that for Jacksonville. So those are my thoughts on players that the Jaguars could potentially pursue on offense. I feel like are really good fits for them. Some of them I'm not as high on, like, you know, I obviously made that clear with Gabe Davis, but there are some really good fits in this free agency class. So we'll see what happens. You guys let me know who you like in this free agency class, who you want the Jaguars to bring in. It could even be about defense. We'll have that episode out tomorrow for you. But I appreciate you being with, here with me. Appreciate you watching the show. Hope you have a great rest of your day. And finally, go Jags.